8.30 in the morning on a Friday, beginning of a weekend, and you're all here? Well, I, I am pleased because what a venue of this library is. And by the way, are those the most comfortable seats you've ever had in a library? <laughs> wow. Very impressive. Uh, I'll make one small amendment to uh, Crosby's introduction. Uh, you did get a free breakfast, most of you, here. A limited one, but uh, now you have to uh, listen to me as the price, so not completely free. I, I knew Milton Friedman, and he was one of the most memorable encounters of my life when I first met him, and I had many subsequent conversations. I was also privileged uh, to have dinner with his uh, wife, Rose, only two weeks before she passed away a couple of years ago. And she was a full partner in all of his activities. She was the editor of his books. And so while we honor Milton Friedman's legacy on his 99th birthday, we also have to honor Rose, who uh, was a major contributor and major factor in his success and his ability to communicate with people. I think I'll leave to your questions a lot of the specifics about Milton's life, but I thought, because I recently, just in May, was in Europe, I thought I'd give you a sense of how Milton Friedman's ideas are more than just dry words on paper, or a flickering image from his famous television series, Free to Choose. You saw a brief excerpt from that earlier. This May, for the first time, I went to the country that has probably implemented Milton Friedman's ideas more than any other in the world. Uh, would anyone like to guess which one that was? New Zealand, Estonia. Very good. We have, some, we have some real readers here. Estonia was part of the Soviet Union. You realize that when you go to their Museum of Occupation and you see the history of the 50-year brutality of communism. 20% uh, of the country died or was deported during that occupation. 20%. This is a country, by the way, of only 1.2 million people. In 1991, Estonia won its independence from the Soviet Union. It was a basket case economically. 100% of the industry was state-owned. But there were some people who had read in Samizdat form uh, translated editions of Capitalism and Freedom and Free to Choose and some of other Milton Friedman's <coughs> work and also the works of F.A. Hayek, the Nobel Prize winning economist. And smeared and mimeographed, these have been handed from person to person. So there was a cadre of people who understood what a free society could be like and the success that parts of that, those ideas being implemented had succeeded in planting all around the world. So in the vacuum of the collapse of the Soviet Union, these people banded together and they formed the nascent government of Estonia. And I remember meeting them for the first time at a reception for all of the three Baltic republics in Washington. It was held at the Lithuanian Embassy. It was held two days after the uh, Soviet flag had been lowered for the last time over the Kremlin. And Mikhail Gorbachev had given his farewell address and retired. And the country, the country had vanished, the Soviet Union. And I remember standing there with the representatives of all the Baltic republics, and yes, Milton Friedman's name did come up because they were already talking about how they would reform their societies. And I remember vividly the Lithuanian ambassador standing up. This is a man who had come to Washington, D.C. as a lowly clerk for the Lithuanian embassy in 1939, at about age 20. Well, the next year, the Soviet Union occupied Lithuania, annexed it, wiped out the country. But the gold had been smuggled out of the country, so there was enough money to keep a nascent diplomatic corps open in a few countries around the world. The Lithuanian embassy in Washington was never closed. This fellow eventually became the ambassador in exile. And every day he would go single-handedly to the office, open it, and sit there like the Maytag retirement. <laughs> Absolutely no comprehension that anyone in the world was paying attention to him. Uh, the office budget was $80,000 a year to keep the embassy open. Uh, he lived on a very miserly salary. And he waited, and he hoped. And he would answer any letter that anyone would send him. 
And then, at the age of 70, he was about to retire. And the Berlin Wall came down. So this ceremony of the Lithuanian Embassy, part of the ceremony was he finally was officially retired. And he was able to turn over the keys to the embassy, which had, sole occupant of which had been him since 1939, and one secretary. He was able to turn over in public the keys of the embassy to the new official ambassador from Lithuania, who was going to take over his job. <coughs> and I'll never forget his speech. He said, for 50 years, I have represented a country whose only boundaries were in the imagination and dreams of its people. And now I can finally retire, having for 50 years represented a country that did not exist in the eyes of the world, but now my people are free to chart their own course. Well, all of the three Baltic republics have charted their own course, but one, most exceptionally, is Estonia. Mark Lahr became the first prime minister of Estonia. He was a historian who had written, even when the, it was an occupied country, about the Soviet occupation. And he was 30 years old. And a couple of years into his administration, he discovered something called the internet. And Estonia, the one great advantage of being occupied by foreign power 50 years is you can build completely anew. So they tore out all the old infrastructure, and they formed the first e-government in, in the world. If you go to Estonia, there is almost no paper in the office. Now, I know the internet has still brought us a lot of paper, but there's almost no paper in Estonia, government offices. Everything is done by the internet. You can do everything on the internet. Um, you can even vote on the internet if you're a member of parliament, and I have a book on that which says maybe that's going a little too far, which we need to discuss afterwards. So Estonia entered the modern world with a big bang. They adopted all of the modern technology with a vengeance. They also, though, adopted some old ideas that are still valid today, the ideas of Adam Smith, the ideas of the founding fathers in this country. And the ideas is updated and enhanced and elaborated on by Milton Friedman. Free markets, free minds, and civil liberties. Estonia today, what's the growth rate in the United States right now? Anyone care? 1.7% are the latest numbers. That's two years after the recovery began. Estonia's GDP growth rate this year has been 8.5% the highest in the European Union. It has boasted the biggest drop in unemployment since the recession began after the financial crisis of 2008. What's the, uh, what's the debt as part of our gross domestic product in the United States? About 72% heading north fast. Estonia's debt to GDP ratio is 6.6%. It is among the best sovereign risks in Europe uh, Fitch, the rating agency, has just raised Estonia's standing to A+. Plus. That's about the rating we're going to fall to in a few weeks. Um, industrial production is up 26%. Export growth year over year in May is up by 53%. Uh, Ericsson is probably the best known Estonian country, company that you might recognize. Estonia has ratified very much the power and the success of Milton Friedman's ideas. Milton Friedman was not just an academic economist, though. He, he was not just an advisor to foreign governments. He was also an active participant in politics. And one of the people that he partnered with at a very uh, early stage in his career in politics was Ronald Reagan. So even though I'm here to discuss Milton Friedman, the most practical demonstration of how Milton Friedman's ideas were put to work in the United States came through the administration of Ronald Reagan. I asked Milton Friedman once what was the quality of Ronald Reagan that he most admired, and he said, without a hesitation, his commitment to principle even when the going was tough. And he gave an example of that. In 1976, Jimmy Carter had won the White House, and he proceeded to, uh, he ran it running as a moderate, but he ultimately governed as a liberal. Of course. We're not familiar with those people today, uh, although one might be sitting in the White House. And pretty soon he launched a massive set of interventionist policies. They didn't work. Uh, reality bites. By 1980, 
we had 10% unemployment, sounds familiar. We had inflation rising. We had foreclosures. We had an unstable foreign policy situation. We had rising gas prices. We even had gas lines. Anyone here remember gas lines? The economy was so bad by 1980 that when Jimmy Carter ran for a second term, Ronald Reagan was able to go around the country with one of the best lines I've ever heard in politics. He said, a recession is when your neighbor loses his or her job, a depression is when you lose your job, and recovery is when Jimmy Carter loses his job. <laughs> now when Ronald Reagan took office, inflation was raging. Uh, so far we've only seen the commodity prices, if you've bought fruits or vegetables or precious metals or gasoline, you know about that. But inflation was raging across all sectors of the economy in 1980. And Ronald Reagan and Paul Volcker, who was a Democrat who had been appointed by Jimmy Carter to be Federal Reserve Board Chairman, decided they had to kill the inflation beast quickly and with no hesitation. So they clamped down on the money supply. And Friedman remembered that Reagan had been told this will cause a deep recession, just as you're going to be entering the midterm elections in 1982. And Reagan said, I understand that, but we have to get this economy in order. We have to establish certainty. We have to give people confidence in the future. We have to do the right thing. And Reagan took that recession. Unemployment rose to 10.6%. It peaked 10 days before the 1982 midterm elections, which did not make incumbent Republican members of Congress happy. Uh, they had two words for the Federal Reserve at that point, and they were not happy birthday. <laughs> but, despite some political losses in that midterm election, the economy did what Reagan and Volcker and Friedman predicted, it recovered. By 1984, when Reagan was running for a second term, economic growth was roaring forward at 7.7%. Two years after the economic recovery after that recession began, economic growth was 7.7%. Today is 1.7%. Perhaps there was a difference in the policies pursued by someone in the 1980s and the difference in the policies pursued more recently. Friedman said Reagan was told over and over again, you've got to ease up. And Friedman said any other president that he'd ever known or read about in the 20th century would have called up the Fed and said, please, please, give us some relief. No, Reagan knew that we had to slay the beast of inflation. And we did. Ronald Reagan changed Washington, then he changed the country, and then he changed the world. One of the things he changed about our economy is he gave people confidence and certainty in the future that if they invested, <coughs> there would be a stable set of economic policies that they could count on. When the recovery began in 1983, it set off a 25-year record in economic growth. Now, we did have two very shallow recessions, one in 1990 and one after the Y2K and internet bubble burst in 9-11, uh, but they were over in months. So basically, for 25 years, that means 100 quarters, four quarters a year, for 100 quarters, with four, quarter except, four quarters of exception, we had economic growth. <coughs> 1983 to 2008 will be remembered as one of the golden eras in the American economy. Now we are wondering, will we ever get back to that? Or do we have a new normal? Do we have a new normal of 8 or 9 percent unemployment? Stagnation. <coughs> With rising inflation, maybe stagnation will even turn into stagflation of the 1970s. Are we going to resemble the economic pattern of Europe? which has pockets of great promise and great exports. And Europe works for those people who have a job. But Europe has structural employment of 9, 10, or 11 percent, country after country. And there have been no net new private sector jobs created in Europe in the last quarter century. None. Net new private sector jobs. Their population is falling. The government employment is growing. But no new net private sector jobs. So the question before us is, are we going to be able to recover from what was even more devastating economic circumstances in the late 1970s? We did find a way back to a more prosperous America for 25 years. Or are we going to pursue policies that are going to establish a new normal in this country, and one we're not going to like, and one in which 
I think not only we will be the victims, but our children and grandchildren will be. You know, one thing I noticed in the last few years is, a few years ago, everyone in America was confident that no matter what the problems they had in their daily life, their children and their grandchildren would inherit a more prosperous America. One thing I've noticed the last few years is everyone, and I'm talking everyone from people relatively well off, to firemen, to policemen, to teachers, not worries that their children and their grandchildren are going to inherit America that wasn't quite as much a beacon of opportunity as they did. How many of you are convinced or believe firmly that your children and grandchildren will have a better and more prosperous life than you? Isn't that saying a lot? Okay, there's one. Isn't that saying a lot about our current conditions? We can do better. We have done better. And that's what I'd like to close on. This is the first time I've been back in Kansas City for 35 years. Now, it's a big country. It's not that I was avoiding you. But uh, it's the first time I've been back in 35 years. The last time I was here, I was 17 years old. It was 1976. The Republican National Convention was held in Kansas City that year. I grew up in Sacramento, California, so we always knew about this part of Missouri, because the Pony Express began in St. Joseph and went all the way to Sacramento. So there's that tie between the community I grew up in and uh, this area of Missouri. In Sacramento, I, um, through a happenstance, got to be a participant in a weekly television show that Ronald Reagan had called Governing the Students. He would have high school students come in and he would hold a mock press conference for them. They would be taped. It was his way of communicating with young people. And he did a few of those shows, so I can honestly say I appeared on television with Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan, the last, after the last show of the last season, he actually called a few of us into his office and he actually told us how he gave a speech. And to this day, <laughs> I treasure those remarks and I still use some of those principles and lessons in preparing my own speeches. Ronald Reagan, of course, spent much of his life as an actor, but he also spent much of his life reading. And a very appropriate comment given that we're in a library. He read, he read voraciously. And one of the things he did was every time that he found something interesting in his reading, this is pre internet, of course, he would write it down a little pieces of paper and stick back cards like this. And eventually, he would color code them along the top. Uh, green was for financial issues with a marker. Red was for commies. <laughs> Yellow was for cowardly politicians. That was a big fix to <laughs> And he would have these index cards in little pockets, especially built pockets in his briefcase. And the way Ronald Reagan prepared for a speech was very simple. He had all of this material with rubber bands around it, and he was, he was the plane preparing to land to give his speech. He would break out the briefcase, he would spread the cards out on the tray table, and he would say, I'm gonna to speak to Ducks Unlimited. I'm gonna to have to have an animal story or an animal joke. So he'd go to the joke pile, he'd take one out, put it down, then he'd say, then I have to make a segue to other environmental issues, then I have to make a broader point about the economy, then I have to have a story here, have a strong finish, have an anecdote there, and you have to have a close. And he pretty much, he'd assemble, like a, like a, a rector said, he pretty much assembled a new kit. It was modular, so he would take one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. He was familiar with the material, but it was arranged in a different way. There was always some new material in it, there was always some old material in it, so he was familiar with enough of it. He was comfortable with the speech, but it was also fresh because it had new material. It was like a chain, a little gold chain that you could take sections out of it replace and put back in, but it was just as smooth and silky as the original because it all fit and he all believed in every part of the message. So Reagan would take all of these cards and he would put a very thin rubber band around, the thinnest possible rubber band you could have, and he would stick it in his coat pocket like this. And Reagan always had a podium, and when he would march up to the podium, he didn't see any notes, he didn't see any text, he didn't have anything in his hand. The podium was bigger and higher than this. So the only way you could spot Reagan's secret was, if you look at the old videotapes, you'll see him hunch his shoulder just a little bit like this. Because that's when he took the cards out, and broke the rubber band with his thumb, and spread out the cards. Now, Reagan knew the material, so he 
pretty much didn't have to look at the cards, but they were there just in case, they were a safety net. And this is a part I've never gotten or figured out, but Reagan was very talented. Reagan was very nearsighted. He had horrible astigmatism, but he had a trick to be able to communicate with his audience better. Before, he had heart contact lenses for all of his life. In fact, he was one of the very first patients of heart contact lenses in the 1930s. Being an actor, he obviously needed them. He would take out one contact lens, put it in his case, and so he would look at the audience. He had one contact lens in, one contact lens out. And with the lens that was out, he would look at the audience. Look at you. And he would see nothing but a blur. Ronald Reagan spent his entire career addressing audiences he never saw. <laughs> with the other lens, somehow he had trained himself that if necessary, he could look down at his notes and figure out where his place was as he moved the cards back and forth. And he could look down, and he, if he was reading a quote, he could look down with the one lens that he had, and he could figure out where he was, and he pretty much knew what to say. Now, Ronald Reagan always had something to say. And one time he didn't have any cards at all it was in Kansas City in 1976. You might remember, some of you, or you might have seen on television old clips, that it was a very tight race between Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan. It was decided basically on the convention floor. And Ford very narrowly prevailed by about 90 delegates out of 2,500. And afterwards, Ford decided that the way to unite the party was to call Reagan down from his stand in the bleachers and ask him to address the crowd to try to rally the party together. And Reagan, after a little bit of uh, hesitancy, decided to come down. And rather than give very brief remarks, I think he gave a nine or 11 minute speech. What Ford had forgotten is the convention vote was so close that Reagan had prepared both a concession and an acceptance speech. <laughs> so Reagan proceeded to give an edited version of his acceptance speech to the delegates. How many of you remember having watched or seen part of that? But you can find it on YouTube easily enough. It was marvelous. There are lines in that that are almost sheer poetry. For years we've been shushed like children and told that we must accept domination by a far off intellectual elite in a distant capital. We have been told that there are no simple answers to our problems. In an increasingly complex world, we must give up the simple answers handed down to us by the Founding Fathers in favor of complex solutions designed by a bureaucratic elite. I'm here to tell you that that is completely wrong. There are simple answers to our problems, just not easy ones. And if we pursue the hard choices that we must make, we can restore our country to greatness. Another great line was, for years we were told we have to make a false choice between left and right on the political spectrum. I do not believe the political spectrum runs horizontally from left to right. I believe the true political spectrum is vertical, it runs up or down, up to the maximum degree of freedom consistent with order, or down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. I always want America pointed up. Reagan gave that speech, and I was on the floor of that convention, a lowly intern. And I remember looking next, the next state over, I think it was Delaware, and I remember four delegates standing there with tears streaming down their face, turning to each other saying, we just nominated the wrong man. <laughs> well, they corrected that four years later. And Ronald Reagan was elected. Um, remember his famous line in the last debate, are you better off now than you were four years ago? I think we'll hear an echo of that in the near future again. And Ronald Reagan was elected, and as I said, he changed Washington, he changed the country, and he changed the world. And much of that he did with the help and the support and the great intellectual foundations laid down by Milton Friedman. Thank you very much. to answer your questions about almost anything unless I choose to duck it.
Well, because they were night and day. Because they were night and day. A bunch of insiders, I knew some of them, I believed them at the time, a bunch of insiders plundered the assets of the Russian Republic and sold it to their friends. And Milton Friedman made one mistake that he always regretted. He said, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, I thought the most important thing we should do is privatize everything immediately. Because even though if it went into the wrong hands, eventually it would be put to better and more efficient use, and eventually it would go into more honest hands. And he said, I was wrong about that. More important than the freedom to get assets out of state control and into private hands, more important than that is the rule of law. You have to have the rule of law. You have to have a judicial system that people will have confidence in. You have to have judges that are more or less incorruptible. You have to have contract law so that if people sign contracts, they can actually be bound to their terms. You have to have a system in which people who engage in fraud or deceit are punished. That there is a foundation. And he always, always supported the rule of law, but he said, I, I, sequencing is important. Some countries got the sequencing right. Most of the countries in Eastern Europe, the Czech Republic, Poland, and others, did get the sequencing right, or more or less, so they figured it out. Some never got the sequencing right. To this day, the Russian president himself, Medvedev, who may soon be contesting for re-election against his uh, mentor, Vladimir Putin, even today, Medvedev in public speeches will say, we are a corrupt society without the rule of law. That's the Russian president saying that. So the difference is, do you have a system in which people believe the economy is being run honestly under open and transparent rules without insiders taking all of the benefits? Or do you have an economy which is basically a kleptocracy, in which the illusion of a free market is created in order to justify private plunder? Makes all the difference in the world. Yes. I'm not an economist, I only play one on TV. <laughs> uh, you know, ultimately that's for the Nobel Committee to decide, although the Nobel Committee is not the only arbiter. No. You know, one of, the, one of the great things about not being in public office is, I can say three words and almost no one in public office ever says, I don't know. There are a lot of economists I admire, but I'm not gonna say that at this point in their careers they're worthy of the mantle of Milton Friedman. Um, first of all, I would be promoting personal friends, and secondly, you know, I'm not sure they're quite there yet, but they're on the way. I, I, economists I admire, if you want me to ask me that. I very much admire Tyler Cowan at George Mason University. I very much admire uh, uh, Robert Barrow at Harvard. Uh, there, are many, there are many, many good economists, but I'm not going to try to put them up in the pedestal of Milton Friedman. Well, I'm not going to presume to speak for him. But uh, he left him enough of a body of work that we pretty much can guess. He would say, we need certainty. We need sound economic principles that have worked in the past, tried and true. Uh, look, the current incumbent of the White House is a very smart man, but he has these ideas, and these ideas override reality. I'll give you an example. During the 2008 presidential campaign against Hillary Clinton in the primaries, there was a famous debate with Charlie Gibson and George Stephanopoulos of ABC News in which Charlie Gibson asked Senator Obama, we have had three capital gains tax cuts in recent decades. All of them have increased the turnover of stocks, the transfer of investments, have enhanced economic activity, and have increased revenue to the federal government. Why do you oppose a capital gains tax cut? Given that it's been proven over and over again, it would mean more revenue. And Obama said, well, it may mean more revenue, but I think it's unfair that someone pay a lower rate on their capital gains and their secretary might an ordinary income. This makes our country less egalitarian. I'm opposed to it. Well, that pretty much sums it up. I don't care what the results are. I have this ideology. And I'm going to pursue it, regardless of the facts. Well, we've been doing that for two years. And he's very certain into the success of his ideas. His administration issued an economic report in January 2009. You can look it up. Jared Bernstein and um, Charlotte Yellen were the authors, his top economists, and they said, if we pass the stimulus package, we guarantee unemployment will not go over 8%. How's that working out for you? <laughs> we are two years 
into the recovery. The recession ended two years ago. You may not feel it, but that's what the statistics say. We are two years into our recovery, and unemployment is 9.2% and economic growth is 1.7%. And the only explanation the Obama administration has is that these things take time, and the stimulus wasn't big enough. Well, if these things take time, they didn't take time in the 1980s, they didn't take time in any other previous recovery, they're just taking a long time now for some strange reason. Yes. Uh, well, political scientists tell us that the public's perception of where the economy is and where it's going is formed a few months before a general election. In other words, the unemployment number that really matters is the unemployment number in July, August, or September of 2012 for a November election. Um, I'll just leave you with this thought. Modern polling was invented in the 1930s by George Gallup. That was 75 years ago. Since then, no incumbent president has ever won re-election if unemployment is above 7.2%. Is there anyone in this room, be brave if you believe it, is there anyone in this room who believes that unemployment will be below 7.2% a year from now? Well, it's going to be a tough road for the incumbent. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yes, in the front. Look, I'm, I'm entering a book leave, so I actually, for now, have nothing to do with the, with the journal. For now, I'm on book leave. Um, going to be a long six months, I hate <laughs> uh, But I still keep in touch with folks. And uh, look, we have diversity of thought. You know, some people say that when they used to read our news pages and our editorial pages, they said they were really happy because they got two newspapers for the price of one. <laughs> um, I'm not going to apologize for the fact that we have intellectual diversity. Look, the editor of the paper, Paul Gigo, writes, writes or controls the editorials. He hires people who usually agree with him, but not always. I like diversity of thought. Uh, I dare you to find that in some other newspapers around the country. <laughs> yes? Kay O'Connor is here. She's from Kansas, which is a neighbor. And she will. She knows very much the law that Kansas passed under the Secretary of State Chris Cole back there. It's a comprehensive election reform bill. And she can. I welcome her to stand up and supplement this. But my understanding is, under absentee ballots now in Kansas, you have to provide the last four digits of either your driver's license number or your social security number, and that's an effective check on the most completely flagrant absentee ballot fraud. It does prevent uh, people from my. Uh, favorite Bretonoir acorn from just, you know, flooding the polls with fake voter registrations, fake absentee ballots. Uh, I'm so glad acorn is brought back into its cage. It's not dead. Remember, acorn was 196 organizations. It was like a series of front groups with back groups and side groups attached to it. The joke in acorn is our organizational chart is so complicated that our left hand doesn't know what our extreme left hand is doing. <laughs> So Acorn, Acorn, an Acorn affiliate has just changed its name and gotten $400,000 of your federal money from, from uh, Washington, even though there's a congressional prohibition on them getting money, they just changed their name, keep their rural taxpayer identification number. But that does, in Kansas, I would say is a model for how you crack down on absentee ballot fraud, which is the real fraud, because anytime you let a ballot outside of the eyesight of an election official, you're asking for trouble. But K might be able to want to supplement that, if you have anything to say. Kay ran for Secretary of State in Kansas. Very short. Um, it was John Fund that inspired me to run for Secretary of State, and I lost miserably. Um, but not my fault. <laughs> absolutely not. Um, and I, I've had a little sickness problems for the last few years. But anyway, one of the things in your book that totally inspired me was the lack of control
for investigation and prosecution by the secretaries of states in the United States, and this is all across, basically. And so when we get back to what Milton Friedman said, the rule of law is really very important in what's going on, is we don't have the rule of law working in the Secretary of State's office, except I think now in Kansas, we'll see some good results here soon. Thank you. This has nothing to do with Milton Friedman at all, just make one aside on this subject. Um, the Secretary of State here, whom I've met, is a very charming person, Robin Parnahan. Um, we had a reform of the federal election laws after the Florida Bush v. Gore recount debacle in 2000, and it said to the states, we're going to give you federal money to improve your election procedures, but you've got to have better machines and you've got to clean up your voter lists of all this deadwood. People who've moved, people who've died, people who are no longer eligible to vote because they're felons, whatever. Well, Missouri got a bunch of federal money. And Secretary of State Carnahan said, we don't need no cleanup. So there were 37 counties in Missouri that had more registered voters than there were adults over the age of 18. This is usually known as a clue <laughs> that something is wrong. So the federal government, the Justice Department, sued Secretary of State Carnahan. And they were winning the lawsuit, basically saying, you're taking the federal money, you're not giving us the reform. Get back the federal money or do the reform. Within three months of the Obama administration taking office, they dropped the lawsuit on the verge of victory. The same month, they dropped the new Pet Black Panthers lawsuit. You know, the new Black Panthers, the ones who carried the Billy Clubs and wore the military uniforms and were intimidating voters in Philadelphia. They dropped it on the verge of victory. You always have to wonder when prosecutors decide not to take yes for an answer and drop a case. So I think what you need in Missouri is you need better voter rolls and the way to get the better voter roll sounds to me like you the Secretary of State. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't want to keep people late, I'll just take one or two more, yes. Just remember, every state has its own set of laws on state contributions to state elections. Most states require transparency on all political contributions made to state and local elections. The Citizens United case was a very specific case brought by the mccain final law, which effectively prevented people from advertising within a certain number of days before a primary general election, uh, and it was a restriction on free speech, and so the Supreme Court ruled. I support the Citizens United decision, but it had nothing to do with transparency. That's a separate issue. If you wish transparency for groups that are free to raise and spend money now under Citizens United, by the way, labor unions have been doing this for decades, and if you believe that labor unions are properly audited, please raise your hand. <laughs> if you wish transparency, I will support your efforts. If you wish everyone who contributes beyond a de minimis amount of money to report their contribution, fine. I'm in favor of transparency. But that wasn't part of the Citizens United lawsuit. The Supreme Court did not have them at the power to say, we declare this provision of the McCain-Feingold law unconstitutional. Oh, and by the way, we decree that you must have transparency. That's up to Congress. Democrats controlled Congress for all of 2008 after the decision in the Citizens United case. Now, they chose to pursue, I think, a very punitive trans disclosure and transparency act, which would have required business interests to reveal their contributions and not apply that to labor unions. I call that unbalanced. I would have supported transparency and did support transparency that covered all folks at all times. I also think that as a matter of law, I think it's unfair that every public employee in states that aren't right to work is required to pay union dues. Those union dues go 80% to political purposes. See the Beck decision of the Supreme Court written by William Brennan, one of the great liberal justices of our time, who said it was unconstitutional for a labor union member to be forced to pay dues to a private entity, his union, and not have any say in 
whether or not those views are spent on politics or on views that he finds abhorrent. So I think if you want to clean up our politics, transparency is fine. That's a very important component. If you're going to be major political players, I think you probably should reveal yourself. There may be instances in which there's rich political retaliation, but I think that that falls to the greater need for the public to be aware of who's involved in politics. At the same time, and there'll be a California initiative on the ballot next year, uh, I think shareholders and labor union members do have a right to not necessarily have their money transferred to political purposes and spend in that way. So I agree with you on transparency, but the Democrats held Congress and the White House for all 2008, and they weren't able to pass a real transparency bill. Um, I would hope that that's possible perhaps in the future. One last one. There is political speech and there's election speech. And if your argument is with the Supreme Court of the United States, whether it's the Buckley v. Vallejo decision, where liberal justices wrote the decision, or whether it's Citizens United, where conservative justices wrote the decision, there's a difference between political speech and election speech. What the Supreme Court has said is, we have free speech in this country. But McCain-Feingold said, if you don't use certain words, elect, oppose, vote for, that is political speech. You can talk about issues if they're not specifically tied to the future of a political candidate or a specific election. So, as I read the law, political speech is run under a different set of laws than election speech. Now, whether that distinction should exist is a separate issue, but this is what the Supreme Court, through several chief justices, has ruled. If you want to contribute to the election of a candidate and you're a foreigner, you can't do that. Now, admittedly, Barack Obama's campaign in 2008 turned off the internet filters that would tell people whether or not you were contributing from a foreign country. They turned off those filters, which is why you had somebody from the Gaza Strip, the Gaza Palestinian Authority, contribute $32,000 through the internet to the Obama campaign. It was discovered months later because they put the words GA down Everyone thought it was Georgia, but it turned out it was Gaza Authority. <laughs> uh, foreigners are prohibited, prohibited from contributing to election campaigns in this country. Are they prohibited from contributing to campaigns that discuss issues or engage in free speech in other ways? The Supreme Court has said no. It is a distinction between political speech and election speech. So if you want to change those laws, I'm sure you can talk to Congress about doing so. But to try to have a blanket prohibition against anyone who happens to hold a foreign passport contributing to any form of political dialogue in this country seems to be a bit much. Uh, we have millions of Americans who were born overseas who are not yet citizens. To say that they have absolutely no say in discussing issues of whatsoever sounds to me like a bit of a restriction on free speech. And the Constitution has ruled that the constitutional protection of this country extend to people living in this country in most respects, even if they're not citizens. So, look. Let me tell you my lessons as a former member of Common Cause in the ACLU in California about political speech and political contributions. You are fooling yourself if you think you can control the flow of money into politics. Because the flow of money in politics is a dirty five-letter word. It's called money. But the real dirty word in politics is power. If you have a government as big as the one we have that can influence economic decisions so that some competitors are crushed by economic regulation and some competitors are benefited by the granting of monopoly or other special privileges. If you're going to have that much power installed in your central government or your state government, you're going to have money chasing that. Money in politics is like a river. You're not going to change the course of a river, except ever so slightly. It will, may be able to, you may be able to block it and have it flow just slightly differently down a different tributary. You can't dry up the river. If you have a government with this much power, and you still have a democracy, you're going to have money in politics. The question is how do you control it, and how do you minimize its effects? You do that partly through transparency, which is why I agreed with the speaker earlier. But if you actually believe that you can close up the flow of money in politics, I give you the last 25 years of campaign finance legislation. It's never worked. Because the people with the imagination and the intent and the motive 
to get money into politics to influence political decisions are a lot faster, a lot smarter, and a lot quicker than the bureaucrats who will possibly come up with laws to stop them from doing that. The answer, if you want to, if you want to slow the influence of money in politics, there are two answers. Transparency will help, at least we know who's just doing it, and voters will be able to pick and choose whether somebody has been, look, I don't believe congressmen can be bought, but I do believe some can be rented or leased. <laughs> and, and you can could, you could decide whether or not there's some new influence exercise on them. Most members of Congress actually do vote on ideological grounds, not on the grounds of a certain amount of cash that special interest members can give to them. Remember, we have declared constitutional that you can only contribute $2,400 a year to a member of Congress at a federal level. Or you reduce the power of the federal government. John McCain and I had a debate on this on ABC. John McCain agreed with me that the industries that are the most heavily regulated by government, including then he was the chairman of the Commerce Committee, the industries most heavily regulated by government are the ones that are most influenced by campaign contributions. He said the industries that aren't regulated by the government, there are very few campaign contributions. What the campaign contributor wants is to steer government policy a certain direction. And you do that by either hobbling your competitor or getting a special privilege for yourself, a special loophole in the tax code, or a special regulation, or a special government contract. You want to slow the growth of money in politics? Reduce the influence and the power of the federal government. Thanks very much. <laughs>